you have to have visionaries. You know, you have to have people that will think outside of the norm. We have to be given the power to tell our own stories. We all want to say our piece. This is a crazy time. What they care about is what it means to them. You have to not think like society thinks. This is a fight about power. Who has it and who has the right to use it? We're having a reckoning about what public safety can, should, and must look like. It's about a broader question of representation and who gets to create the images and define how we see the world. They want their voice to be heard. They have to get involved. Finally, we get to tell our truth and tell our stories like our stories matter. What's going to bring people together is equality. The love that we have for each other is the shortcut to true human happiness. You start to see how it's all connected. Every single person around the world can create a movement. Please welcome to the stage Atlantic Live's Senior Vice President and General Manager, Candace Montgomery. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you found the first half of programming insightful. We're excited to continue with the second half of programming to learn practices we can apply to help us do the work to build a more meaningful life. Before we get started, we want to recognize our underwriters, the John Templeton Foundation and Tito's Handmade Vodka for supporting the Atlantic's journalism. Also, we want you to be a part of the conversation online. If you want to post on social, please use the hashtag Atlantic Happiness. And to the virtual audience, you can submit questions via the Q&A tab on your screens. Now let's get started. And now for our conversation about leading with empathy, please welcome Lisa Osborne Ross, the US CEO of Edelman, Evan Sharp, the co-founder of Pinterest, and Shelly Zalis, the CEO of The Female Quotient. Here to lead the conversation is Atlantic staff writer, Annie Lowry. Thank you. Um, so Lisa, Evan, and Shelly, I want to thank you so much for joining us. And before we dive in, I want to remind everybody that we're going to take audience questions at the end of the panel. So for our virtual audience, you can submit the questions via the Q&A tab that you see on your screen. And for folks who are in the room with us, you can ask questions at the mic stand when we're ready for that portion of the conversation, which will be at the end of the conversation. So we're going to get started now. So the pandemic heightened a lot of fractures or difficulties or pre-existing uh, questions about the American workplace. And senior leaders are now within companies working to address the issues uh, that have been heightened by the pandemic of burnout and employee retention, especially as we see a great shift in workers, switching employers, maybe finding new career paths. And so, Lisa, you've talked about leading with empathy as being a core part of the strategy um, uh, towards addressing those issues. So I want to start with you. When you're advising clients, what does that look like now, practically, as we are coming back from this period of tremendous disruption and churn? I think, um, and I'm careful how I say this, if I could get past the loss of life and livelihood associated with the pandemic, I would embrace what I think are many, many silver linings. And one of it is the way we are rethinking work and the way we are rethinking workers and the way we are rethinking the contract and the engagement and the trust that has to be established. And um, I think it's actually a really exciting opportunity and and I embrace it. I, I have a wonderful colleague, Sydney Roach, who in the beginning of the pandemic renamed the CEO as the chief empathy officer. Uh, I love the reaction to it and she will too. Uh, but it is with empathy that we are asked, not just asked, it is with empathy that we are required to lead and I think the pandemic, and not just the pandemic, but the past three years and the racial reckoning that this country has had to deal with, um, which is another gift, uh, I think we're going to be in a better place as a result of all of this. 
Okay. Evan, I want to go to you. Do you agree with some of that? What might be better here in this period of, and I'm glad that you highlighted this, of trauma, of pain, of extraordinary difficulty that we are kind of, I think, a little bit having the bends as we're coming back from. Um, you know, what are the silver linings, if, if you've seen some of them from this really dark cloud, that, that you would identify? Well, um, thanks for having me. And, you know, I agree with Lisa. I can only speak to what I've seen at Pinterest and maybe in the consumer internet industry. But for us, the pandemic, the way I think of it, 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 it accelerated trends that it started a few years earlier about what employees really expect from work. You know, we'd seen for five or six or seven years leading up to the pandemic, more and more employees, of course, wanting financial security, you know, career advancement, skill development, but also now new emergent expectations around meaning and purpose, around community, mm -hmm. around cultural leadership. And when the pandemic hit and all of our employees were home, working from home for the first time and cut off from a lot of their community, all of those needs came to the front in the workplace. And I think we're really challenging for our most senior leaders for whom that wasn't what they thought work was about. And so I think the silver lining is it's, it's a chance now for senior leaders who have worked a long time to develop their management and leadership skills to really rethink how they can be more compassionate in the way that they lead and manage their teams. Okay, Shelly, I'm gonna to go to you and ask you the same question. What's, what's the kind of upshot that you might be seeing of this really horrible thing that we've all been through? Well, I mean, I think, you know, we keep talking about the great resignation and so many women in particular are leaving the work force in, in droves and in tremendous magnitude. And I think it's time to start talking about the great retention. And I think what's so amazing to me is we always do exit interviews. Well, you know, it's too late. Everyone's left. So I think, you know, it's so funny because I was with Ariana Huffington and she always says, you know, why do we do exit interviews? Everyone's gone, right? It's time to do the stay survey. Like, let's talk to people about what does it take to stay? And let's start looking at, you know, not only the great retention, but here we are at the happiness conference. Let's go to what does it take to be happy? We all know we have one life, which includes work. So let's move beyond even retention to what does it take to be happy and what's the aspirational opportunity? I think we have a real opportunity today. And let's wipe the slate clean and think about closing the door of what's wrong and let's open the door of what can be right. And I think we have a real opportunity right now. And as Lisa talked about, you know, chief empathy officer, like, instead of chief executive officer empathy. But I don't really know if a CEO knows how to do that. Like, how do you define empathy, right? And I think when we but think Shelley, about that. But you are a CEO. Yeah. And you are empathetic. Correct. And I am a CEO, and I am empathetic. And I think the requirement now uh, is you have to, it's a different skill set that's required. Exactly. Um, in the C-suite right now. Right. And understanding stakeholder outreach, engagement, asking people what they think, listening when it is the last thing that you want to hear, and acting on it, it's a whole new set of skills. Amen to that. And that's the point. And I think that that's where we're at today. If we finally did stay surveys asking our employees, instead of telling them what it's going to be, asking and listening to what they want, what they need, and actually listening to hear and delivering on that. Because pre-pandemic, we weren't. And I think that CEOs today, actually, empathy needs to be contextualized and framed. I mean, when I was rising the ranks and I sold my company as CEO, I was told in a boardroom, there's no room for emotion in the boardroom. Hello. Is that gonna be acceptable to me? Hell no. So what did I do? The next day, I went out and I spoke to thousands of people. And you know what my speech was called? Bring emotion to the boardroom. <laughs> because I was gonna change the equation. And as a CEO, I wasn't gonna be a chief executive officer. I was gonna be a chief empathy officer. And that's what it takes today. And that is our opportunity. So what does it, 
What does this mean to uh, being receptive to hearing as the leader of an organization? What is it that can be hard to hear from your employees? Because I hear a lot of this, and I'm like, you know, in the great resignation, I think one of the biggest driving factors has been just money, right? Like, people want to make more. There's been an opportunity to increase your wage by switching between companies. But I think that all of you seem to be driving at there's something else. It's not just, this is not just about compensation and about kind of like economic churn, it's about culture. I, as a um, woman and as a woman of color, am never going to say it's not about the money because it is. It's a large part of it, but it's not the only thing. Um, one of the things that I think that we have learned to do, and we talked about this backstage, is to listen not just with empathy, but with clarity, and to have that really hard conversation that you have to have with your colleagues that says, we may not agree on the outcome. I think that's where so many people fail. You overpromise by, you know, we're dealing with so many things right now, automation, climate, uh, racial injustice, inequities. Um, people have different points of view on how they want to be at work. And I think a mistake that CEOs often make is to say, everything you say I'm going to do, it's not going to happen. But what I can promise you that whatever I do will be informed by what you think and what you believe and what you say. And whatever decision I make, um, because that's my job to make the decision, I will have you first and foremost top of mind. I, I've always had an approach that so far has worked that if you put people first, profitability follows. So my responsibility as the chief empathy officer is to listen to people, to make hard decisions, but then to be realistic that we are not always going to agree. Evan, do you have something to um, yeah. want to bring you in here on how this might have happened? This conversation <laughs> might be happening at Pinterest. Well, you know, what came to mind for me was as a founder of a company, this is not uncommon that you learn to manage on the fly. So you start a company because you build something, never managed anybody, and now you're building a team. And so as I went through that journey myself, I think I was really surprised how so much of what you do in management is about these extrinsic motivators. So about compensation, about performance reviews, about meeting others' expectations, and how little was about aligning work with what people wanted to do with these intrinsic motivators that, you know, if you come from a creative field, the most creative work is always the work you love to do. And there's a lot of science behind that as well over the last few decades. And so one of the things I'm excited about from a business perspective with this shift is I think better business outcomes may be possible when work is more intrinsically motivating to, to the people doing it every day. Mm -hmm. And that's also, you know, it's a side benefit to people also being happier and staying at your company, but the work itself could be better as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would say when purpose meets passion, you're unstoppable. And I think that so many, especially women today, are um, leaving with purpose. You know, purpose is in their DNA. And I think, of course, money and, you know, compensation matters a lot, but I think that purpose is very important. And I think one of the greatest uh, values and what is so important for CEOs today is to continuously reinforce the purpose of, of companies. And when you look at the SDGs and, and the global goals and, and the consistency of reinforcing what a company stands for is very incredibly important, especially for the younger generations. So I also want to come to the kind of flip side of the conversation that we're having about how do you set a boundary for, because at some point a job is a job also. And I think that one thing that we've seen is that the pandemic has trampled the line between work and home for a lot of people. Um, we are answering emails on the weekend. Uh, I think that there's been some, some questions about like, does, does your work have to actually be kind of all consuming in that way? And it feels like that might be cutting across also what you're saying. You want people to have purpose. You want them to be happy in their workplace. But what, what's the pressure as a CEO to also say that you know, people can go home and, and stop working? People should go home and stop working. <laughs> I, I can't say it more clearly. Um, I go home and I stopped working. And we are a very, very successful company. I think one of the mistakes, it's not a mistake, but I think something that has evolved and changed, we have all grown up and been told we have to balance. 
We have to balance work and family. We have to balance all the aspects of our lives. And I think this is about integration. I think it is about bringing them together and finding ways that, um, that matter for you. I had, um, I had last week, I had one of those weeks that sort of crystallized so many life lessons for me. Um, a week ago today, I had to put my beloved English bulldog, Violet Elizabeth Taylor, to sleep. Uh, my husband's retirement was Friday. Um, I lost a huge piece of business, and I won an award for um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and ability. And um, we launched a project with Gallaudet University, and it prompted me to think through what makes work work for me, and what makes work work for other people. And I concluded that, one, um, you have to do something that matters. Like, you have to go to work, and you have to care about something that you're working on. You have to feel like, uh, to Shelley's point, that it has purpose, that it's going to have an outcome, and that the world is going to be better because of your intervention. Um, you have to have people who believe in you and that you believe in. We talked backstage a lot about trust. Um, and you have to have a remarkable support system, um, people that uh, challenge you, people that champion you, uh, people that shape you. And you have to have a little English bulldog named Violet mm -hmm. Elizabeth Ross. And um, if you have those things, I feel like you can make your work work and you can find that happiness and that balance um, and that integration, rather, that we're all talking about. Mm -hmm. Evan, do you have thoughts on, you know, I know that your company went remote and came back and has now uh, a lot of folks are still remote. So I'm wondering, um, again, in this climate in, in, in which we're still blurring work and home, um, how, how does leadership, uh, how do you set that boundary for leadership? It's hard to beat Lisa's answer, um, <laughs> I think, but, you know, a friend of mine, Dr. Keltner, who's speaking tomorrow, he defined meaning to me as being in relation to the forces larger than yourself, and I really like that. And I think for me, the pandemic hit when my daughter was just about one, one and a half, so I was sort of forced to be home like a lot of people with my, with my child and was forced to be in contact with a force larger than myself on many dimensions, on the work version of that, on the personal version of that. And so, you know, I don't have an answer better than Lisa's about how to integrate the two. I think the integration is what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Shelley, I also want to ask you about, you know, if you're leading other people and you're setting corporate culture, right, or advising businesses on how to do this, how, how do we think about it, um, not just at a personal level, but also, um, you know, if you're, if you're managing an organization or setting um, a culture for an organization? Well, listen, I, my nickname is Chief Troublemaker, so you're, I mean, I created the young corporate rules when I started my company, so... Um, you know, I, I believe in life stage accommodation, and I have a no regret policy. And, you know, mine is I never want to look back and say shoulda, woulda, coulda. And so balance is a word that doesn't exist. I think it's, you know, life is messy. You have one life with five dimensions. You have your work, your family, your um, community, your friends, and the one we always forget about is yourself. So don't forget about yourself. Put yourself in that equation. And you know, different parts of life are going to take different priorities. And so it is about integration. And you got to mix and match at different stages of life. And so I think that you know, at every stage of life, you have to pick different things and, and mix it up. You know, it's not like even slices of the pie. And I think that that's how you have to think about the same thing at work and with all of your employees. You got to let them have a life. And at different stages, you accommodate differently and let them you know, mix it up too if you want to have a successful culture at work. And that's how I've always led my company. And I had a 99.999% retention inside of my organization. You trust your employees to give you their best and live a successful, full life that includes their work. Mm -hmm. And that's how you roll. And you get the best out of your employees too. They give you what you're giving to them. 
So we've talked about um, being open and empathetic and hearing things and perhaps even hearing difficult things. So I wanna ask an open question to all three of you if any or all of you would like to answer, but what's some feedback that you've gotten either from shareholders or investors or a manager or from your employees um, that's been hard to hear, that's led to a change in practices in you know, the last couple of years? Well, I went first on everything, so I uh, <laughs> kind of cheesy if I don't do it now. Um, look, we, like everyone else, are trying to deal with return to the office. And um, when I leave here today, I'll go down and meet with my colleagues in our office in San Francisco. But throughout the U.S. operations, people have gotten used to coming home. And a, a really talented woman said to me in Minnesota last week, she's like, I've gotten used to having dinner with my kids, and I'm not giving that up. And I said, bravo. But please do come into the office, uh, like between 10 and 3. Because what happens when you are in the office is that you can say, Evan, that was so awesome, or Shelly, we need to work on that. You can interact with people. And I think you can do both. And I do think it's, it's, it's uh, I don't think it's as hard as we feel that it is. But, you know, we talked backstage. I don't know that we will ever go back. I hope that we don't. I think putting your family first, and whether it's your family, I have a thing, I'm a working mother, but I have a thing about mothers. Like, everybody has a life. It doesn't matter whether you have children or not. Um, but this integration of life and, and trying to find a way to do it, I think is, is something that we have to noodle on and we have to give grace and flexibility when we try to execute and recognize we're gonna mess it up, it's gonna be messy, we're gonna do it wrong, but we will get to a good place. I think we will get to a good place. You know, I think for Pinterest, as we went remote, we lost a lot of the listening systems that we had with employees about how things were going, what was going well, what was going poorly. We used to be able to walk through in the office for an hour or two and sort of touch a lot of different teams and people at different levels and projects and get a really good sense. And in an entirely digital world, it felt like leading blind, blindly, I think, for the first few months. And so one of the things we had to do was rebuild a lot of our communication infrastructure from scratch, and that's been really difficult. I think we've done a decent job, much more one-on-one, -on -one, much more skip level, you know, much more invested in cascading management, uh, communications through middle, middle management, much more in-person event pre-planned. So there's, there's a lot of things you can do to address that, but it was a, it was a really big change for the company and how it operated. I think that, you know, I, I think hybrid is, is the solution. Um, but I think it can't be elective. I think we need more predictive flexibility because if we allow for the elective, then guess who will take it? It'll be the women that opt in because caregivers are still predominantly female. The men will show up. We end up with the golf game again and the bias barriers will kick in and that will become a big problem. So we have to not make the exception, it has to become the new norm so that it becomes equal for all and we move forward with uh, more, more equal opportunity and we don't create the divide. It's an interesting thing that you point out that you can imagine a kind of a difficult scenario that might arise if the parents never come into the office and the folks who have the time, um, and not just, I, I think that the completely right, not just parents, they're probably just one obvious category, but the people who have more pressures outside of the office and more responsibilities outside of the office don't come in. And the people who have fewer of those who I can imagine are earlier career or just have more flexibility with their time do come in, that that could create a, a rift in office culture. Um, so I'm wondering, right, like to what extent is, is tailoring um, to each individual something that's good to do versus setting those principles, you know, that feels like an impossibly hard question, but I'm also interested to, to, to hear how people are grappling with that. I think what you've touched on is, and I'm intrigued by this live question, I believe that empathy is hugely important. I wonder, though, if the topic we're also talking about is having emotional intelligence. And for me, I think sometimes we just overthink these things. 
this is all about being human. This is literally understanding if you can come in and it makes sense, come in. I talk about being present with purpose. So if there is a reason for you to be in the office, come to the office. But if you're working on a proposal or doing something, you're going to be sitting with your headphones, you can do that at home. But a lot of it is just the way we interact with each other has got to be based on humanity. It's, some of it is like just manners. I, we, we, I, I started this thing, which I didn't think was a thing, uh, uh, when I first came to our office in Washington. And I had a colleague, and I hope she's listening, and she said, OK, just tell me. I'm a rule follower. Are you saying we have to speak to people in the elevator? And I was like, <laughs> oh my god. And she was like, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I want to be in good standing. And I was like, yes. Would you please speak to people in the elevator? <laughs> And in doing so, you might find out what they're working on, what they're really good at, uh, what their strengths are, uh, if they're struggling. And that is your job as a manager to be engaged. But that's just like humanity. That's just like manners. And I think if we leaned into that, a lot of these things would be so much easier. And giving each other the grace that, look, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to make the wrong I'm going to make the wrong decision. I'm going to make a mistake. And so are you. But let's keep it moving. Um, and I think if we just were more kind to each other, which is rooted in trust, which I think leads to happiness, we would be a lot better off. I actually, I actually think it's also redefining the interviewing process, because I actually think sometimes we, we're even interviewing for the wrong things. Like, I hire for passion, train for skill, because I think it creates a more human, how we're hiring our employees. You know, unless you want to be a doctor, lawyer, or an accountant, I think skill might come into play a little bit more. <laughs> so other than that, but I, 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 that, that's how you get a better culture, right? So we have to rethink even how we are hiring people, by the way, just FYI. Sorry, your turn. Thank you. I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, I mean, I'm just struck, this is obvious, I think, but given what you said earlier about the emotional boardroom and what you were saying, I mean, just how weirdly contorted work was maybe there before the pandemic. Like, this part of us can come to work and this part of us can't come to work. We're like, what the, what the hell are we doing? Um, I mean, a little bit. And so there's a way in which, you know, of course, emotional intelligence, I mean, emotions are an incredibly powerful source of knowing, as is the intellect, as our intuition. and we all these different capabilities built into our psyche and our body, and it's exciting to think about a workplace that embraces all of them together. Well, unfortunately, we have to wrap, and I'm so sorry we didn't have time for more questions. I feel like we could sit and talk about this for a very, very long time, um, and I will bring up with The Atlantic our silent elevator policy <laughs> later on. <laughs> um, but I really, really appreciated um, having the opportunity to discuss this really rich issue with all of you. Um, so thank you to everybody. Thank you to our panelists. And we're going to go... And now for a session produced by our underwriter, Tito's Handmade Vodka, please welcome Amy Lukin, the chief joyologist of Tito's Handmade Vodka. Well, hello. So how do we scale happiness? The Nordic countries seem to have figured this thing out. We have plenty of research that tells us how happiness is created. So where should we begin? What if I told you a crazy idea? What if business had the capacity to scale happiness? I want to tell you about a little experiment that we've been doing back at Tito's for several years. Uh, we've been mixing this recipe. It's got a few ingredients to it. It's got a little bit of gratitude, a little bit of love, a little bit of meaning, passion, vodka. Um, some emotions. It's got a lot of kindness and a whole lot of serving the community. Um, it started 25 years ago when Tito Beverage, yes, his last name is Beverage and he is in the beverage industry, was invited down to um, bartend at a charity event. At the end of the, the night, the charity came to him and was just crying, hugging, thanking him for showing up. 
He was overwhelmed with gratitude. And so that night, what he did, he decided, you know what? He told all the employees, any time a charity in your community is doing something good for the community, the answer is yes to free vodka. Give it to them. Because that night, he realized they were doing something good for the community, and he got to do good with them. And he was overwhelmed with gratitude. His hopes were that his employees might also feel that gratitude. And that maybe that they would get connected to their communities and start to have more meaning in their jobs. But that's not where the experiment started. The experiment started actually in 2015. Tito walks in and he says, I've been thinking, I wonder if uh, we put more love out into the world, would love come back to us? I'm like, hmm, good question. And he goes, well, let's just do an experiment. He said, why don't we just flatten the marketing budget and triple the philanthropy budget? And I said, whoa now, big boy. <laughs> and he, his theory was, why not take the profits of the company and give it back to the communities that grew the brand to begin with? And so he came out again to all of us, and he said, find your passion and wrap a Tito's label around it which meant go out and find those nonprofits in your community that mean something to you and figure out how to wrap it into your business. So the joy budget was designed that day. And the joy budget is basically a little pot of gold that each one of us have, uh, a little bit of money that we can find the causes that mean the most to us and we can support them with his money. So an example of this would be Johnny Gaffney in New York. Johnny's uh, sister was, design, or, uh, excuse me, was diagnosed with lupus. So Johnny's mother and his sister uh, were on a walk for a cure for lupus in New York. They wore bucket hats because if you're familiar with lupus, those uh, with lupus have severe sun sensitivity. And they named their team Unconditional Love. Well, the hats were so popular on the walk. Everybody wanted one, so Johnny came up with the idea. Let's produce lots of hats, sell them, and donate the proceeds back to lupus. Well, Johnny now gets to use his joy budget to match all of the funds that he's raised at these charity events to give back to lupus. Talking about a way to find purpose on your job and wrapping a Tito's label around it. This joy budget has become so popular that we started with a couple hundred charity events a year. Now we're doing several thousand charity events a year. Giving has become contagious. Now, the next thing, though, uh, we decided to start to stir in another ingredient to it. We wanted to build in some other good rituals, habits to the culture. So we came up with 20 or more rule. And that means when 20 or more of us are gathered for a meeting, no matter if it's local, regional, national, we've got to build in two hours of community service into the agenda. So you can have several hundred uh, service projects going on around the country. Now, what happened with this, we were not expecting. Our hardcore competitive liquor sales reps started to turn into mush. Their hearts started opening. They started having more compassion. They were more empathetic. They would call in tears talking about the lives they had changed that day versus how much they had sold. <clears throat> the other thing that started to happen that we weren't expecting was after the gratitude started growing in the company, more compassion started growing, people really felt like they had purpose in their job. Innovation started happening all over the place. Beth Belante has been rescuing dogs all of her life, but she took her passion from a childhood days and turned it into a mission at the office. She designed what's called Vodka for Dog People. It's our most popular program to date. You can go into hotels, restaurants, bars across the country for a yappy hour, bring your dog in, have a Tito's, and everybody gets to raise money for the local shelter. OK, so the culture is growing. It's shifting. It's just rocking along. COVID hits. And <clears throat> it was a no-brainer. We sent our employees home March 13th. By March 22nd, the employees came up with the best innovation of how to give back. 
They shut down some of the bodily lines from the vodka. They turned it into hand sanitizer lines. They produced, uh, at the end of the program, nearly 1,300 tons of hand sanitizer. The sales reps would get this hand sanitizer from the distillery and quickly distribute it to the first responders, hospitals, nursing homes, nonprofits. These three were ahead of the distribution at the distillery. They didn't really feel like they were making a difference. <laughs> they were making a difference. So we didn't, th this model's not perfect. We're just humans. We're, we're still trying to figure this thing out. Um, we didn't set out to scale happiness. Right? <clears throat> we just said, hey, let's, let's look at this recipe. And what we found out was the most important ingredients to this recipe was first loving your people at home, first and foremost. You have to love your employees solidly. You have to not just pay them a decent wage. You have to pay them a good wage. You have to give them uh, good insurance, and you give them a 401k and, and match it with them. They deserve to plan for their future, too. Once that, that is established, that basic foundation, then you start stirring in the ingredients of gratitude and compassion and, you, and the habits. I, so imagine this with me. What if all companies turn their business model upside down? Because if you think about it, the three largest employers in the United States, if you combine all of their employees, you will have 5.8 million people, compared to Finland with a population of 5.5 million. Finland, the happiest country on the planet. We would already have 300,000 more people than Finland to begin scaling happiness. If you want to continue pondering these thoughts with me, meet me at the bar later and I'll buy you Tito's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And now for a special sneak peek at Ken Burns' PBS documentary, Hiding in Plain Sight, Youth Mental Illness. Hi, I'm Ken Burns. It's my pleasure to join you for the Atlantic's In Pursuit of Happiness event to share a powerful new film that provides a space for young people to talk about their mental health journey. Hiding in Plain Sight, Youth Mental Illness, directed by my longtime colleagues and friends, Eric Ewers and Christopher Ewers, will air on PBS over two nights, June 27th and 28th. The clips today highlight just a few of the powerful stories shared by the more than 20 young people interviewed as part of the film. I think you'll appreciate the resilience as well as the power of the storytelling. We're reminded that by listening, we can help people heal. As a country, we must acknowledge this crisis and ensure that we are providing the resources and care our young people deserve. As parents, Friends and neighbors, we must listen to what they are telling us. This is a crisis that affects us all and deserves our attention. For more information about hiding in plain sight and for access to more resources, please visit wellbeings.org, the public media public health site created by my partners at WETA, the Washington, D.C. public television station. Thank you. I couldn't make sense of the emotions. Why am I acting this way? When I'm mad on the inside, I'm mad on the outside. When feelings really interfere with their everyday ability to live, that's a challenge. I feel very unmotivated, disinterested. I had so many emotions that I had to deal with. You may have a hard time identifying that something is wrong. It's not like cute to like be popping pills every day and like overdose this many times. I just didn't want to talk about it. I just wanted to leave it alone. At that age, how are you ever going to admit, I can't see past tomorrow? 
These are the, the chronic issues of early life. Why are so many kids having these issues? Everybody's got their own story. These are the journeys of more than 20 young Americans from all over the country and all walks of life who have struggled with thoughts and feelings that have troubled and at times overwhelmed them. They share what they have learned about themselves, their families, and the world they live in. You're fighting this fight that you truly have no idea whether you're going to win or not. Stay strong in your resolve because you're worth it. They speak for many of us. They speak to all of us. For a conversation about prioritizing your mental health, please welcome Vivek H. Murthy, the U.S. Surgeon General, with Jeffrey Goldberg, the Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, glad to see so many of you here. Thank you very much for coming all the way to Half Moon Bay. Um, tell us first, if you don't mind, what is a Surgeon General? <laughs> Well, it's a good question because a lot of people don't know. Uh, and in fact, I've realized that because, um, you know, I was getting on the plane the other day and the woman in front of me turned around and looked at me and she said, hey, why don't you go ahead into the plane? I said, I'm happy to wait my turn. And she said, no, we can't fly the plane without you. <laughs> <laughs> this happens not uncommonly, but I will tell you that, um, and I also, do, many people think I spend all my days just stamping bottles of, you know, of alcohol and boxes of cigarettes with warning labels, but <laughs> they're in fact two key jobs that the Surgeon General has. One is to oversee the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, which is one of our eight uniformed services in the U.S. government, and the one solely dedicated to health. So we have 6,000 officers who are nurses, doctors, uh, physical therapists, pharmacists. We send them around the country during times of emergency, including uh, COVID-19. The other job of the Surgeon General is to communicate with the public about issues of critical importance to health. And that can take the form of issuing Surgeon General reports, uh, as I did back when I was Surgeon General during the Obama administration around the you know, alcohol and drug crisis we have in America or around e-cigarettes. It can also look like building campaigns, enc encouraging communities to take key actions, and also starting conversations about public health matters that we may not be talking much about. So it's a, it's a flexible job. It's one where you get to sort of set your own agenda. It was uh, one of the reasons that I was actually excited to serve. What was the, just spend one minute on this, and we're gonna get to COVID and mental health in a, in a second, but what was the role, what is the role, I should say, of the Surgeon General in a pandemic? We know what the CDC does or doesn't do sometimes, or the FDA, the NIH. What does the Surgeon General do for the last two years? Yeah, so it, it's an interesting role. I mean, the, the Surgeon General during a pandemic uh, is certainly, one key role is to communicate directly to the public about how the pandemic is evolving, what things people should do, how to interpret information that may be coming out, and that's why I spend a lot of my time with community engagement, media, et cetera. But there's also another role in during a pandemic, which is, I think, equally if not more important, which is to bring together community organizations, local trusted community leaders, to make sure they have the tools they need to communicate directly to the public, because uh, those trusted voices are often you know, equally as important, if not more important, I would say often more important than the voices you may see on TV or hear from government. And so it's pulling those folks together and, and convening those organizations, supporting those groups that has also been an important role of our office. And finally, during this pandemic, uh, you know, I, I've, I also work very closely as part of the White House you know, COVID task force uh, with some of our other core leaders, Tony Fauci, Rochelle Walensky, David Kessler and others to help uh, you know, develop a response to new things that may come up, like new variants, for example, or challenges we may have with therapeutics. Uh, I will just say just, you know, all of this that I'm describing to you is, is technical work, but in, there's something deeper that I feel each and every day when I serve in, in this uniform. At least something happens once a day where I pause and I reflect on just how incredibly fortunate and lucky I am to have the opportunity to serve at a time like this. Uh, I was not the most likely person to serve as a Surgeon General. My, my grandfather you know, was a poor farmer in a small village in India. 
Um, my father should have been a farmer. I should have been a farmer. I should have been growing mangoes, coconuts, and and tamarind. You know, if uh, you know, if probability dictated life. But the fact that my parents were able to come to this country, that I was able to get support and help from public school teachers, that I was uh, later asked to serve in government. I mean, this is one of the few countries in the world where the president of the United States, you know, would ask this grandson of a poor farmer from India to look out for the health of an entire nation. That's the promise of America, and I'm just so deeply grateful for it. Right. The, um... <laughs> Talk about... So we know that Tony Fauci's job is infection control, right? Uh, we know what FDA does. You as Surgeon General, it's a little bit of a bully pulpit, and it also looks at, at issues in a more 360 kind of, kind of way. Um, that's, a, that's a gentle preface to a question um, about what we might have done wrong during the pandemic. Um, we're talking a lot about depression, about social recession, about all kinds of mental health dilemmas that not only young people, but a lot of young people are experiencing. If you go back two years and do it again, what should we have done differently to take into account other factors besides infection control? Well, it's, it's not only an important question, it's a necessary question. We should be doing this kind of review of our response efforts to understand what did we do well, what didn't uh, we do right that we need to do differently. And uh, to, to say what we should do differently, I just want to be clear, is different from blaming folks who took those initial steps. I recognize that you know, in the first year of the pandemic, uh, when uh, President Trump was, was in office, when his team was responding to the pandemic, I, I know just from my own experience with Ebola and Zika that sometimes in that fog of war, you're trying to make the best decisions you can with limited information, and, uh, and you do the best you can. But I think in retrospect, a couple of things I think we would have perhaps approached a bit differently. I think one is, just, is, is a, I think, more transparent and a more um, deliberate conversation about the benefits and also downsides of some of the precautions uh, that we were taking. So for example, take school closures. Uh, many schools in the spring of 2020 uh, closed down because they were worried, right? And, you know, and I understand why that happened. We, there was this virus spreading. We didn't know fully the consequences for our children. We wanted to be safe. We wanted to protect their lives. But then there became a question of, well, when does the balance shift toward it harming kids, you know, in terms of not being in school? How does it affecting their learning, affecting their social, emotional health and well-being? And I think those conversations were, uh, I, if, if I had my druthers, like we would have those in a more robust way, in a more transparent way with more people at the table. Um, this is one of those things where to make a decision on a, a precaution, you don't just need public health leaders at the table. You need people who represent education. You need teachers at the table. You need uh, parents also participating in those conversations. And collectively, you have to make a decision about how to move forward. I'll lastly, just say that this requires something which I worry we have in short supply in our country right now, which is it requires trust. Trust between individuals, trust between individuals and uh, public health institutions and government. Because in the absence of that trust, uh, <clears throat> you know, decision-making bodies will worry that any uh, wrong move, any repercussions will result in tremendous criticism, blowback, pushback, et cetera. And that I worry makes our institutions sometimes more risk averse. Uh, than they should be. Let me just ask one follow-up to something you said. You said you should have, among other people, the teachers at the table. But wasn't it the teachers' unions that, that played a disproportionate role in keeping schools closed as long as they did? Well, I think that, you know, we certainly had, you know, they, they were te well, there were multiple phases of the pandemic, keep in mind. In, in the first year, when schools were closed, there were many voices that were sharing their point of view. What was less clear to me as an outsider, somebody who was not in government at the time is who was actually at the table helping make these decisions. That was hard to understand from the outside. What I can tell you like after is after President Biden uh, took office and when we all came in, one of the things he actually said to all of us very early on, even before he was sworn in, is he said, we have to make it a priority to get our kids back to school in person. We've got to do that as safely as we can. But he, and at that point, many of us had seen like what the negative repercussions were for our children. Um, now, as safely as possible is the key, key phrase here, because there were things we could do to make it safer, uh, and we knew uh, how to take those measures. But again, this comes back to the trust issue and also to the broader issue of misinformation. Because at that point, there was so much misinformation that was floating around, and misinformation also uh, prospers and thrives in an environment where there is mistrust and polarization. 
At that time, it became much, much harder to have a real conversation with people about the importance of taking those precautions. So masks in schools became polarizing. Even testing, in some cases, in schools became polarizing. These measures, which you know, my kids you know, were using during the pandemic in their school to keep them safe, and which we wanted for all kids. So I, while there's a lot technically that we might think of that we could do differently, to me, to truly safeguard against the next pandemic, some of the key issues we have to work on are addressing misinformation and rebuilding trust well, in the public. I wanted to ask you that. Uh, the, 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 the lack of trust in institutions that previously, FDA, CDC, for instance, had high regard across partisan lines, that seems potentially disastrous. What can you do specifically to reach 30, 40 percent of Americans who now have a kind of comprehensive distrust for federal government institutions, and also, by the way, science. I mean, you have the bully pulpit. You've got the yeah. handsome uniform. <laughs> You're flying the plane, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, for everyone's benefit, you should know that I do not, in fact, fly planes. So that's a, it's a good thing from a public health perspective. Yeah. But, but I think that there are a couple of things that, that are important here. One is to know that trust is easily lost but not easily regained. It takes time. It takes a lot of effort. I don't think that you regain trust by putting glossy ads on TV you know, or redressing your website. Uh, I think the way you do it is several fold. One is uh, you've, got to, you've got to communicate clearly, consistently. Uh, and transparently with the public about issues that are sometimes thorny, sometimes where you don't have the answers. I think about this very much in the way that I think about doctoring. You know, there were times as a doctor where I didn't know what a patient's diagnosis was, where I maybe knew the diagnosis, but I didn't know how we could treat their illness, or, or where we didn't have a medication to treat them. And in those moments, like, you know, we, I didn't, you know, hide in the closet and say, well, when we figure it out, then we'll come and talk to the patient. No, you have to have the conversations with the public and be honest and open about what you know, what you don't know. But the other thing we have to recognize is that trust has also flowed much more locally. So people, in an environment where people are getting messages all the time online, they, uh, I think, come to rely even more on the people who are actually physically present in their lives. Now, I think about this with regard to the Public Health Service Commission Corps that I lead in particular, which I think can be a powerful vehicle to rebuild that trust, because we have officers in locations all around the country they are serving their career, uh, you know, individuals. They are not political appointees. Um, they know their communities. And if we can strengthen those relationships with their communities, such that when somebody, you know, thinking when a public crisis arises, someone is thinking, okay, well, who's a public health officer in my community who's been here for years who I know? Let me ask them for their advice because I'm confused by what I'm hearing online. To me, that's a way of rebuilding trust in health, in government. But trust, it has to be rebuilt locally. I think that's uh, very, very important. One, one, one potential problem here is that we have seen the rise of, I, I will editorialize and call them quack doctors, or doctors who are not buying the uh, otherwise universal scientific consensus around vaccines, for instance. I mean, how do you combat that within the medical field itself? Because this, your plan is obviated by the fact that some people in communities aren't going to endorse what you might think of as an acceptable solution to a pandemic, for instance. It's, it's a really important question. And like not, you know, just like no profession is monolithic. And there are some doctors who may have a different point of view that may not be supported by evidence, let's say. Or they may have a legitimately different point of view when there's not enough evidence and people are trying to make a judgment call. And that is actually, you know, Jeff, that's been one of the messy parts uh, of this pandemic is that as it's been evolving, people are seeing scientific decision-making discussion happening in real time. And sometimes people will look at that and say, wow, these people seem to have different opinions. They have no idea what they're talking about. How can we trust these folks? But what they're seeing is like, is a little bit of data emerges, people are debating it. More emerges, people are debating that, potentially changing their opinions based on new information. So part of what we have to do, and this is part of what I laid out when I launched in 2021, my Surgeon General's Advisor in Health Misinformation, is we really need a broader effort at digital health literacy uh, that helps people understand not only how to identify what's you know, false and inaccurate online when they encounter it, but also helps them understand what are accurate sources, what is the actual process like of scientifically determining what's true, what's not true, not because they have to do it, but because when they see a process in effect, they can understand it. And finally, we have to create access points so that people have access to more than just their own doctor or just the own public health official. We want them to have access to multiple credible public health sources so they can see where the preponderance of scientific opinions are. Mm -hmm. Um, let's turn to something that you've been thinking about longer than the pandemic, social isolation, loneliness. Loneliness has physical manifestations. Uh, 
Talk about, let's start with teenagers, because it's a preoccupation of yours, I think, uh, young people. Um, describe the damage done, and describe where teens were before the pandemic and where they are now. You don't well, have to limit it to teens. You could do younger and, yeah. and older, obviously. Well, I think to all of us who may be parents or grandparents or who may have kids in our life that we love, we have a picture of what childhood should be like, right? A time when we are growing, a time when we're protected, a time where the possibilities are opening up in the world and where we're experiencing joy. Sure, we maybe encounter hardship and adversity, but where we have the support to overcome that. For millions of kids in America right now, that is not the picture of their childhood. We have rates of anxiety and depression that have been increasing in our country. Even, and, and some people think this is all the pandemic. It is not all the pandemic. The pandemic has made things worse for some kids. But it, consider this, in the decade prior to the pandemic, there was a 57% increase in the suicide rate among youth. There was a more than 40% increase in the percentage of high school students who were saying they felt persistently sad or hopeless. Uh, we were seeing multiple indicators moving in the wrong direction before the pandemic. And the question is, why is this happening? Well, I think it's, again, not one reason, but there are several factors at play. One, we have certainly seen bullying on the rise. And you know, whereas when I was a child, if I did something dumb in woodshop class, you know, 12 kids knew about it. Uh, and now you do something that may be embarrassing, and all of a sudden it's posted online, and you, you're subject to both in-person and online bullying. Uh, so there's that. There is a struggle with loneliness that many uh, kids have been encountering, often silently. And many people think, oh, loneliness is a challenge with adults and older adults. Uh, exclusively, it turns out younger people are actually experiencing much higher rates of loneliness than, than older people, even though they may be more connected uh, by technology. But finally, think about the fact that young people today, when they look at the future, uh, we all think that the future should be brighter than the past, right? But many young people today don't feel that way about the future. They're looking at the specter of climate change. They're looking at the ongoing threat uh, of racism. They're looking at violence in their communities, and they're ask and they're looking, frankly, at the polarization. Uh, and breakdown of community and dialogue in our country. And they're saying, really, is the future really better than the past? So you put all of these together along with the lack of access to mental health care and the stigma around mental health, and you start to understand why it is that our kids are struggling. From a teen mental health perspective, if you could get rid of the social web, if you can get rid of social media, would you? <laughs> don't, don't answer diplomatically. <laughs> Well, you know, it won't surprise you, like, like most things, it, it is not black and white because social media has been helpful in some ways uh, to kids. It's helped people reconnect with old friends. It's helped people find communities, especially those who may not have too many others like them. Maybe they come from up and underrepresented communities or, uh, or such. But we know that it's been harmful to some kids, that it has increased feelings of anxiety, depression, and loneliness. I talk to young people all the time in roundtables across our country. And one thing they consistently tell me is that even though they use social media a lot and they find it engaging and entertaining, many of them say that it also makes them feel worse about themselves, that it amplifies this culture of comparison that we always had in the country, but it feels far more intense and worse now than it ever has. And what that does is cumulatively, it actually reduces their sense of self-worth and their self-esteem. They might feel good about themselves and they go online and they see that their friend is posting these amazing pictures of vacations and parties they're going to and great clothes that they're wearing. Uh, even though the, we all know that the experience on social media is experience of comparing your average days to other people's best days, it still makes people feel uh, bad in the end. So uh, you know, I think, all, I, I think with my own children, my kids are small, they're four and five, uh, I would like to protect them from social media as long as possible in its current form. Uh, but I think that this is, my hope is that we will see a new generation of tech entrepreneurs rise who will recognize that we need technology that can truly connect individuals, that can build healthy relationships, that can foster community. We need that. Uh, but right now, our metric of success and our business model with social media platforms is often um, on amount of time spent, not time well spent. Right. And so we, we don't drive toward the important substantial relationships that we all need in our lives and that our kids are saying that they want more of. Um, we're gonna go to questions in a couple of minutes. One, one last question for you about loneliness. Um, and we've talked about this before. Uh, the, the political dimension of loneliness. We see a lot of studies that talk about white males, white males in their 50s, 60s, um, totally alienated from the rest of society, manifesting itself in very unhelpful forms of anger. It's not just white males, obviously, who are dealing with anger, polarization, anime, et cetera. But, but talk about 
uh, in the context of the polarization, talk about isolation and loneliness? Because I think you have some interesting thoughts on this. Yeah, so I've encountered few people in the country who feel that the state of dialogue in our country is healthy. Uh, and if you do feel that way, please come talk to me afterwards because I want to know what you know. Uh, but it's a real challenge. But it turns out that the loneliness and isolation plays into this. It's a very interesting thing biologically that when we are separated from other people, when we feel lonely, that actually puts us uh, into a state of hypervigilance where we are more likely to perceive threats where they don't exist. And you might think, well, that's strange. Why isn't that? Wouldn't we want to welcome people in when we're lonely? Well, no, it turns out if you think that thousands of years ago when we were hunters and gatherers, if you were separated from your group, that meant you were more likely to get attacked by a predator, right? So you wanted to be hypervigilant. Even if there was a 1% chance that that twig cracking behind you was a predator, you wanted to interpret it as such and react accordingly. That doesn't help you so much in current society, right? If you are hypervigilant, constantly perceiving benign uh, overtures or, or actions as threats. But that is what we're dealing with, and that is why chronic loneliness can actually be quite harmful uh, to the social fabric. And it becomes a downward spiral where the lonelier you are, the lonelier you become, and, and on and on it goes. And <clears throat> this contributes to polarization as well, because when people are feeling lonely and alienated, uh, that can manifest in different ways. Some people's manifestations may be that they become quiet and withdrawn even further. Others may become angry and cantankerous. Others may lash out with emotional or physical violence. So it is in all of our best interests to make sure that people, not just ourselves, are feeling connected. You know, I just also want to say just a last thing on this point, because this is so important. Addressing loneliness is about more than alleviating a bad feeling. Like we have seen now in study after study that people who struggle with loneliness, uh, that's associated with an increased risk, not only of anxiety and depression, but also of heart disease, of premature death, of dementia, uh, of sleep disturbances, and on and on the list goes. But it turns out that our relationships with one another are extraordinarily healing. And I say this as a doctor who's prescribed many medicines over the years. There's a place for medicine, there's a place for technologies in helping us when we're ill. But positive, healthy relationships, these heal always. And it reminds me that we all have the power to be healers, not because we have an MD or an RN after our name, but because we were born with the ability to give and receive love. That is our most powerful, powerful gift as human beings. And I believe in this moment where so many people in our country are in pain, when we're experiencing so much division, when so many people are feeling alone and alienated, especially our children, we are called upon to find those gifts again, to use them to build connection in our lives, in our institutions, in our communities, so that we can all collectively heal. We have um, two microphone stands if you want to come up and ask. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. Um, I can barely see, so okay. Uh, we have questions also from our audience uh, on the web. The uh, one question is, uh, this is a good one, emerging from the pandemic, what resources and tactics can we use to address loneliness in the mental health crisis? I mean, what, what can the government do? So I think we can, we can address loneliness on three levels, like on a policy, institutional, and individual level. From a policy perspective, the government identifying uh, loneliness and social connection as a priority, uh, identifying the rebuilding of community and connection as a strategic objective for the nation is powerful. The government can also invest in research in these spaces, lay out a strategic uh, plan for how to address this. This is actually part of what our office is working on, the Office of the Surgeon General. There'll be more to come on that in, in, the, in the coming months. But on an institutional perspective, if you run an organization, whether it's five people or 500 people, uh, the culture that you create in that organization is, is powerful in terms of giving people a sense of connection to one another. And we know that when people feel connected in the workplace, they are more productive. They tend to stay uh, at work as opposed to dropping out of that workforce. Uh, they tend to be more creative. Uh, as well. So it has benefits, but there are small things that we can do to help people develop relationships with one another, get to know one another as human beings, not just for their skill sets. And finally, at an individual level, um, we also have to recognize that there are decisions each of us are making every day about how we spend our time, attention, and energy. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what's driving those decisions? Is it people or is it something else? 
And I will admit to you that I have lived much of my life, despite everything I'm telling you right now, I have lived much of my life making those decisions primarily driven by work, not driven by people. And during the pandemic, and in actually the, the year preceding that, I came to realize just how much that had hurt me. Uh, because in 2019, in the President's Day weekend, uh, it was about a year and a half after, almost two years after I was out of my time as Surgeon General, uh, the first time around, I ended up in the emergency room with my daughter, who was one year old, uh, because we had noticed that, that day that she had stopped putting weight uh, on her right leg. And she was one year old and we didn't know what was going on. We examined her and quickly saw that she would not let us straighten the leg. And so my wife is a doctor as well, and our minds went to the worst places. You know, what could be happening here? Is there like a rapidly evolving infection? So we took her to the emergency room. And while the doctors were trying to figure out what was going on, I still remember the feeling of sitting there in that emergency room and feeling so profoundly alone. Because I had come out of my time as Surgeon General, having put all of my time into work, thinking, oh, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I've got to prioritize work. I had neglected my relationships with friends. I had even the time I had with family. I was immersed in my devices. I wasn't paying attention to them. And at that moment when I needed community more than ever, I felt like I didn't have the right to reach out to the people in my life. Um, and it was a scary time for us. You know, we ultimately uh, found that she did in fact have an abscess, a collection of bacteria in her leg, and she had to get emergency surgery uh, to get uh, the abscess trained. And um, it was just an incredibly painful experience for us. But in the days that followed, what I saw was I saw the community that I thought I had lost come to life. You know, I saw friends who just heard about what was happening reach out. My mother and my mother-in-law both came in uh, and to town to help out. Um, even the strangers at the hospital who didn't know us stepped in to lift us up. And I was reminded of just how powerful our human connections are in our lives. And so, especially as we come through this difficult pandemic, where our relationships have been tested, we've been separated from many people we love, the choice that we have today, the decision we have to make as a society is going forward, do we want to build a truly people-centered society where our relationships, our foundation of well-being are strong because we've invested in them, because we've chosen to prioritize people in where we put our time, attention, and energy? Um, you know, I'll just have to say this, Jeff. If I had coming out of residency training, if I had told the folks at work that I was moving to a small town in America where I didn't know anybody, but where they miraculously offered to make me the chair of the Department of Medicine straight out of training, people would have said, wow, that's incredible, great career move, you're doing great for yourself. If I instead said, you know, I'm moving to a small town in America where I don't have a job yet, but my family is there and my old friends are there, so I'm just gonna settle there and look for work, people would have said, wow, he had such, so much promise, such great ambitions, and uh, I guess he's just uh, given up. Um, to me, that is a symptomatic. And I had, in, I had in, you know, in, internalized all that value system, but I want my children and your children and all of our children to grow up knowing that their self-worth is not dependent on how much wealth they acquire, how much power they acquire, how fancy their job title is, or how famous they are. I want them to know that their worth is based on that fundamental ability to give and receive love, to serve one another, to build relationships that heal. If we do that, our kids will be well. Um, let me go to this one question here, and then we're going to wrap up. You might have just started to answer that question, but uh, I'm, a, I'm an internist and hospitalist uh, and part of a multi-state hospital medicine practice. Um, and our profession is struggling. Uh, you know, two years of, of absolute destruction of our profession, loss of trust, uh, overwork, burnout heading into the pandemic, um, and obviously a lot worse uh, coming out of the pandemic. How do we as healthcare leaders start to resuscitate our profession? Probably warrants its own two-day conference, but I'd love, to, <laughs> I'd, lo I'd love to hear your thoughts about the steps that we should be taking as leaders of the healthcare system. Well, gosh, thank you so much, sir, for that question and also for your service during the pandemic. Uh, I'm deeply worried about our colleagues. <laughs> You know, I'm deeply worried about our colleagues in medicine and nursing in the medical and public health professions. They're, they're burning out in extraordinary numbers. And I'm hearing from more and more people in the community who are saying, hey, I can't see my doctor anymore because she or he has dropped out of the workforce. They're no longer practicing. They closed. 
and it's because people are burning out. I, I worry that people in the general public don't fully understand how this crisis of burnout is already starting to affect their ability to get routine care, not just care for COVID, but their routine care. This is actually an initiative that we are launching, uh, you know, something around, an area that we're launching an initiative around that will very soon, so we'll have a lot to say there. But a couple of things I would just point out that we have to do as a country. Uh, number one, we've got to recognize that making access to mental health services available uh, for people in the health professions is essential. And people assume, oh, if you're in the health professions, you've got ready access. That's not the true, uh, necessarily. A lot of people don't, and even if they have insurance coverage, they don't have the ability to actually go and see a, a provider when they're working. Uh, 60, 80, 90 hours a week. The second thing we have to do, though, is to, within our institutions, we have to create a culture where it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to take time and seek that help, uh, and where we actually make it readily available where people are. And many people say it's still not permissible to take that uh, take that time. And then third, we've got to look at the work itself. You know, uh, of clinicians, we have over the years, I think, taken the relationship uh, between. Uh, health, you know, healthcare professionals and their patients for granted. And we've said, okay, we can just, you know, just continue to pile uh, more uh, regulatory requirements, more paperwork. Uh, we can put, you know, electronic health records in front of you that are really designed for billing, but make you go through a gazillion different steps that often don't have a lot to do with patient care. And we can do that because, you know, you'll, you'll somehow figure it all out. But it's taking a toll on that connection, that relationship. Uh, I remember a patient once telling me when I was rounding on her in the morning with my team, she pulled me aside at the end. She said, can I just ask you, you guys come and you visit me in the morning, and then you come back around in the afternoon, but I don't see you in between. Are you guys out golfing? Like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was heartbroken, because I was thinking, like, this whole team is dealing with all of the paperwork and other regulatory requirements that they have to do while trying to take care of a patient. But patients and doctors both want to be together. But finally, it comes back to this connection and community piece as well. Many, the rate of loneliness among doctors is actually higher than in the general population. And it's surprising because you might think, well, aren't doctors surrounded by colleagues and patients all day? When you are, it's actually not the case. And I think part of what we have to do is think, how do we intentionally rebuild a sense of community and mutual support within our healthcare institutions? Uh, because you can, as human beings, we can tolerate a tremendous amount, like when we are working together and supported. When we are on our own, that changes dramatically. And there are far too many clinicians who are feeling profoundly isolated in their work right now. Um, we are out of time, unfortunately. I do have one question that I've wanted to ask you for a long time, which is this. When you go to your own doctor and your doctor says, Vivek, your cholesterol, do you respond by saying, I'm the Surgeon General of the United States. No one tells me what to do with my health. Or tell me about your relationship with your own doctor. What is that like? <laughs> Well, it's funny you ask, because I literally just went to see my primary care doctor two days ago, and one of the things we were talking about was cholesterol. <laughs> no, I, 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 I talked to your primary care doctor you a couple days ago. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The electronic medical records are not that safe. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, but it's actually, it's a funny thing. Like, as a doctor, like, sometimes the last people you want to have is your patients or other doctors, because you don't know like, how much you're going to second guess things, et cetera. Uh, and I do, like, have my own opinions about things, but, like, I've like run it through my head so many times that like sometimes I just want to know what somebody who's not biased, like by my own like you know baggage, like has to say. So that's actually why I really appreciate having a primary care doctor and who can just like help me make some decisions and then I can move forward with it. But I don't envy uh, my my doctor because um, yeah, I, I don't I, I don't think I'm an easy patient. So <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very very much. Appreciate your time here today. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. And now for a wellness moment with Arthur C. Brooks. Today's exercise is called extrinsic versus intrinsic goals. So to start, there are two kinds of goals, extrinsic goals and intrinsic goals. What are extrinsic goals? Well, money, power, and fame, basically. These are the things that the world rewards you with. They're the rewards that you get from the outside. Hence, they're called extrinsic. Intrinsic goals, on the other hand, are goals that give you deep-rooted satisfaction or intrinsic satisfaction. It comes from inside you. Intrinsic goals are most often involving good human relationships, relationships with families and friends and a romantic partner, or maybe even a relationship with the divine. Today's exercise is geared toward helping us migrate away from the extrinsic goals in our lives and toward the intrinsic goals. And it's an exercise that has three steps. 
Here's step one. Imagine yourself in five years. So let's say you're 27 years old. Imagine the 32 year old version of yourself. Imagine what you're doing, what you're thinking. If you're 57 years old like me, then think of the 62 year old version of yourself, which I'm doing right now because I'm recommending it. And, and, and frankly, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of freaking me out here a little bit. So I'm gonna have to take a moment. Anyway, back to you. The five years older version of yourself is happy. I don't have to tell you what that means. You, you, you know what that means. You're a happy person. Now comes step two. I want you to list five things that are actually making you happy five years from now. Okay, now, this sound might sound like it's impossible, but it isn't. You know perfectly well the kinds of forces that would bring you authentic happiness, don't you? They're probably not the five things that you've always thought about the most, the things in your bucket list, you know, flying in a hot air balloon or having a fancy timeshare in Belize. That's not on your top five. Think about the five things that are the reason that you're the happy version of you in five years. Now, I want you to put them in order. One, two, three, four, five, where one is the force on your life that's bringing you the most joy five years from now. And five is good, but it's not one. Okay, now what are they? The extrinsic stuff practically guaranteed is gonna be four and five or three, four and five or something like that. And one and two is gonna be relationships. It's gonna be love. It's gonna be intrinsic. It's gonna be your ability to maintain the type of love that you actually crave, isn't it? Yeah, well, me too. Now, what do we have? We have a happy version of you and we have the list of the five things in order that are gonna make it so. And this leads us to step three. You need to manage number one and two. Are you right now? If you wanna to get to that, you wanna to get to the top two things on your list five years from now so you can be the happy version of you in five years, you better be actively managing number one and two on your list. Are you? You might not be. <laughs> I've taught this to a lot of people and I find that most people aren't. I find that most people are managing number four and five on their list. Why? Because they're easier to manage because they're physical things, because they're tangible things, because they're extrinsic things. They're easier to imagine, and so they're easier to conceive of and get, and, and we manage what we can see. But those aren't the most important things. So this is really step three and the most important part of all, which is taking action to start managing to number one and two on your list. The love that you want in your life, this spiritual journey that you're yearning for in your life, it's not gonna make itself happen it's not gonna manage itself. You need to manage it. Now do this exercise once a week for a month and think how it's changing your priorities and then do it for the rest of the year. I guarantee you your priorities are gonna change because you're gonna give more attention to the things that really matter. You're gonna be thinking about them. You're gonna be thinking about ways to develop them. You will start to reap the joy from the kinds of things that's number one and two. The journey toward those things turns out to be the real secret of happiness. And you're gonna be doing the kinds of things that Dr. Murphy talked about in this episode. What you focus on more is what you will manage going forward. And you'll become a more intrinsically motivated person reaping the happiness rewards.